let's stipulate that you're right about infinity. I'm, I'm still not sure this is the right methodology. So there also aren't any uh, zero width wires in the world, and there aren't any frictionless surfaces or frictionless inclined planes. Yes. Uh, but there are still lots of generalities that we can usefully study and understand, which we can only get at via that idealization. I mean, I, I don't, I, it doesn't seem to me it would help the study of classical dynamics to say that every time we use uh, um, a frictionless plane in our models, then we actually ought to say what we really mean is a very small friction, and we ought to include that in the model rather than zero. I mean, it seems that hmm. the right way to think about what's going on there yeah. is that we've got a, we've, we've got we've got various properties that we can only understand in a sharp way in the idealization. Yeah. But of course, we acknowledge that real-world systems will approach that idealization only imperfectly. Yeah. So, so it kind of seems like even if, even if you're right about the absence of infinity in the physical universe, the methodology yeah. you're suggesting kind of unnecessarily ties the hands of, of, of physicists. Yeah, um, that's fine as long as one makes clear that this is what one is doing, that it's that kind of idealization. Um, that's absolutely fine. It still is interesting to ask those questions, what, how big or how small should the coefficient of friction be in order that this is a good approximation? And so yeah. it, it does lead to interesting questions. Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm not saying that there's, not, there's then a subsequent question, which is where, where, you know, when are those good and bad idealizations? Yeah. But the idea that we shouldn't use the idealizations in our theorizing yeah. seems rather strong. Well, I mean, like, likewise, black holes. You might say that there's a good question about what yeah. extent see, any real physical system approaches yeah, that are physical idealization. I mean, the interesting thing comes back, if we go back to Rogers' scry plus and scry minus and so on, and the Penra, the ADM at infinity and all the rest of that, it may not matter in many cases, but it, it sets up a context in which there are questions you can't ask, which are actually interesting questions. Um, a, 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 a couple of uh, comments. The point about having this sort of very local region that's going to affect us, I can think, I mean, there's one other factor there, and, and what all the other stuff that's well off our timeline does is that it determines the time scale, the expansion time scale of the universe. Okay, so if you don't have all that stuff, then you're not around for long enough to have the stars. Well, Peebles uh, will tell you that that other stuff is irrelevant. Well, the time scale is only dependent by what's inside this ball in our past. That stuff over there doesn't change the time scale over here. What changes time scale here is what's within this ball here. But, not, but the stuff that's not bound, I mean, if you have a universe that's the size of our galaxy, you know, its time scale is a month. Uh, it's not 10 to the 10 years. So that's why we can't live in a universe that's just the size of our galaxy. You know, you would think that 100 billion stars is, you know, can provide all the stuff we need, but it doesn't provide enough time. I think you're wrong about that for the very simple example. I can take that universe which you have got, and I can make myself a model universe where I identify it on the scale of 10... 10 parsecs, 30 parsecs. It's got exactly the same dynamics, but you don't need the actual infinity to get the same dynamics because to take your model universe, mm -hmm. do a torus topology We've identification, choose any size you like for that torus, and you, the, the dynamics are unaffected by that physical scale. So that physical scale does not need to be big in order that the time scale of the universe be big. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was just thinking about simple topology here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my second point was, which is probably more straightforward, this point about the local global connection. Yes. So a few years ago, Doug Shaw and I studied this problem um, well, rigorously, but in a different way. Yes. So you start with, a, assume your whole universe is slightly inhomogeneous, so you have an exact solution, and yes. then you've got your local planet or solar yes. system, which is a perturbed uh, system. And then you're looking for a matched asymptotic expansion. Yes between the two systems. Correct. So there's no asymptotic flatness at all yes. in this. No, no. Ma and match you can establish that yeah. then such yes. a thing exists. Because then you're matching them at a finite radius. Yeah, yeah. That, so so that, that radius is basically what I'm calling the finite infinity. Yeah, yeah. That's basically, it's basically the same approximation. Yeah. So we did this for sort of all scalar fields, as it yes. were, because you're interested in a problem, as we were, like 
if there was variation, say, of the fine structure constant yes. on cosmological scales, yeah. does that mean you should see variation in a yeah. laboratory yes. experiment? Yes. No, no. People but just assume that. much asymptotic expansions are exactly in the spirit yeah. of what I've been saying. Yeah. So we've done that. And, various, yes. and you can sort of quantify what would be the magnitude yes. you know, of the effect here from things that are yes. different distances away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. like that. Yeah. I like that. Um, I'm just uh, curious as to how you'd react to, or how you analyze, or how you think De David Hilbert would channel in these space times where you can have in a finite causal past of uh, another world line that's actually got infinite proper time length. So I'm thinking of these kind of Malamont Hogarth style space times derived from like, rotating black holes. Um, I'm afraid I haven't thought about that. I'd have to think about that. But explain the problem a bit more. I mean, you, you can have in one observer's uh, kind of causal past a, another observer which is traveling along an infinite length proper time going off to some singularity, of course, and the whole of that path yeah, is contained yeah. in the causal past of just yeah. one, one observer. I, I haven't spent time looking at this stuff. I tend to regard this as rather unphysical, the same as a whole lot of the stuff about worms houses unphysical. Yes, it's a kind of a theoretical possibility, but in practice there's no mechanism which will generate real wormholes and there's no mechanism which would generate this kind of thing I don't believe I mean I mean some of the proponents of these theories they would say that you know if you have a certain our best explanations of certain I don't know Kerr rotating black yeah. holes yeah. and so on would indicate that one has these yeah. kind of situations I yeah. mean it contradicts um, cosmic censorship and so on but um, I'm afraid I haven't looked at that I'd have to look at it properly uh, well, as coffee is coming, I would have disagreed with you on ten things, George, but let <laughs> me just agree on one. Uh, what do we need to understand th this room and why we're here? I think you left out one absolutely essential thing, which is that the really key thing that governs everything in general relativity is the initial value constraints. Mm -hmm. Everything about general relativity is contained in the initial value constraints. And to understand why we have an inertial frame of reference here, why there's any stability, why there's any sense that we can talk about and, and I don't bump into you and things like that, is entirely due to the solution of elliptic equations on space-like hypersurfaces which extend out to infinity. And as of now, the only robust method which has been found to do that is the one that Jimmy York found in 1971-72, which uses surfaces of constant extrinsic uh, uh, hypersurface of constant extrinsic curvature and those surfaces are really genuinely distinguished in space-time by a really fundamental symmetry principle and I don't think you can possibly understand why we're here without taking that message on board and let me just make one final remark the whole of numerical relativity relies on Jimmy York's work before they can do any experiment numerical experiments they have to get initial data which satisfy the initial data constraints of general relativity. Uh, Only then can they start evolving. Are, are you insisting that it just depends on conditions at spatial infinity? If it's, uh, I like you, I, I, I'm very fond of a spatially closed universe, and the, the great joy of, of Jimmy York's work is that he gets absolutely perfect solutions. Uh, existence and uniqueness is absolutely rock solid. Uh, in, uh, without any boundary conditions in a spatially closed universe. On, and in GR terms, it's on spaces of constant extrinsic curvature. And cosmologists really know very little about so the initial value problem of GR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so are, are you trying to claim that the existence of inertia determines for us the global topology of the universe? No, I'm not saying that because of the point you made that the equations of GR observed locally are, are local equations. So from that, we can't deduce what it is. But we can make a conjecture. You wanted a good conjecture for what's the best topology. I would say it's S, it is the S3. And the reason for that is there is the Yamabe constant, which is, does two things. It tells you about within one manifold what metrics you can have and how far they, how irregular they are. And then it also distinguishes between manifolds. And there is one manifold which is distinguished to the extremum of the Yamabe constant is the round sphere on S3. Yeah, well, the, um, so this is, if you want a principle of, the dis of, of determining the, uh, the topology of space, there it is. 
So you, so you would exclude Wheeler and Einstein that we couldn't possibly have an S3 because of this principle? No, on the contrary, that's what I think it should be. I think Wheeler and Einstein I thought you said it was E3. S3, no, sorry, you didn't hear me. I said S3. Uh, okay, well, there's all sorts of... So in other words, you would make a prediction that when we get the final measurement of the Planck satellites that we will find that the spatial curvature is possible. That would be a prediction which will either verify or disprove what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, the first point is that if K is plus one, then it is compact, and I'm very happy with that. <laughs> I, I noticed that your, uh, your, your notion of, of testing uh, experimentally is rather black and white. You seem to envision disproof and even proof. Uh, I think you would have a better justified and more capacious way to... Uh, to reason in terms of Bayesian probabilistic shades of yeah. gray there, and yeah. you, you wouldn't need to demarcate science from non-science either. Yeah. Uh, d do you think that, that most of your points, or, or all of them, could be, uh, could be reframed in that way without loss, or maybe even I, with I, gain? I, 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 th yeah, I probably think it could be. I should probably talk to Peter Coles to get him to do it for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think probably it can be. Mm. Thank you. OK, a, a wonderful note of peaceful Bayesianism. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. <laughs>